Johnny Long here. I'm in the slightly odd position of reading out an advert about how we have no adverts on Escape Collective. Now, I don't think all ads are evil, but I definitely prefer Our Little World to exist without them. Our website is so, so clean, and our podcasts are blessedly free from any messages imploring you to buy some green gloop that would definitely make its way through your system quicker than the time it took to put your credit card details in to buy six months worth of the stuff. The trade-off here, in order to keep things nice and pure, is we need you, yes you, the person listening, to sign up to become an Escape Collective member. That's the only way we can make this membership-funded model work. We don't have to go with our begging bowl to marketing executives like the vast majority of cycling media do. I will not drink the green goop. You can't make me. If you are already a member, thank you so much. You are appreciated beyond words. And if you know someone who's on the fence about signing up, why not give them a friendly little nudge? Hey, if we sign up enough members, maybe I will drink the green goop after all. Go to escapecollective.com forward slash member to sign up. Welcome back to Geek Warning, the podcast that puts all you need to know from the world of cycling tech in one place. I'm Dave Rome, and joining me this week is Brad Copeland. Brad, welcome back. Thank you, Dave. Brad, uh, I've asked you about your favorite bikes that you've owned, uh, but given that you're on the tools pretty much every day at the moment, uh, what's the most interesting bike that's gone uh, that's been clamped into your workstand this week? Oh man, I've had some real some real doozies this week. Uh, doozies so, in a good way or a bad way? A uh, bad way and oh, a no. good way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go with the, the most probably interesting one. A little bit of a novel one was a. A Moots Womble. Do you know that bike? A Womble? It's kind of like I'm struggling uh, to remember what it is. I know the name. It's like an aggressive Talk me through it. hardtail. Right. Titanium, okay. Which Moots, you know, so yeah. you expect a nice yeah. quality titanium sure. hardtail frame. Yeah. Um, what sort exactly of generation right. is this? How, it's brand how old new. are we? Brand new. Oh, it's a brand, brand new. 2024 okay. Moots. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're kind of not a dealer like stocking but we have the capability and um this mm. one was cool it's like full chris king spec uh had like a new sram transmission exo level one it was pretty good but you know it's a solid build mm. all all new stuff pretty high end yeah, hadn't right. seen one before it has like five inch travel fork on it so it's kind of like a wow do everything hard to help but cool bike Nice bike. You're nice. you're uh, you're living in the Pennsylvania area. Is that is that sort of a normal bike for the for the area? Normal mountain bike, like is a trail hardtail. Common. Uh, there's a lot. I don't know. You know, there's so many genres of bike these days. Um, yeah. I, we we sell a few bikes like that. Okay. though. Yes, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it's super okay. common. I wouldn't necessarily say it would be the bike I would have chosen either. But uh, okay. Objectively. <laughs> yeah. Cool bike, sure. You know, and yeah. I've always been a, a yeah. huge fan of Moots. I think Moots in general makes some. Uh, some of the nicer titanium frames available mm-hmm. these days and really forever. So, um, yeah, certainly I, can't I fault, had, fault his taste. Yeah, I had a uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, growing up in bikes, you you have an appreciation for moots, and uh, I had uh, at the past place of employment, the old place, uh, we had uh, a field test in Steamboat Springs, which is where moots is. And we'd uh, they'd invited us for a factory tour, and I was going to do a, a photo gallery there. And then uh, uh, this was kind of peak COVID time, and one of our testers ended up testing positive to COVID, and our factory tour got cancelled. And I never got through the doors of Moots, and I was like all of two minutes away, and you know, h- halfway across the world, and heartbreak. So oh, yeah, so close that's like the trip that got so away. Far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I spent yeah. a summer in Steamboat, and I was amazed by, I mean, everybody, like even little kids and everybody, they had like weekly yeah. mountain bike races, like kind of local, just local series events. And they have, you know, some old World Cup ski facilities there, which are sort of like the host site and start finish area. And uh, little mm-hmm. kids on up to every single person, like everybody's riding a boot. So it's cool that they're supporting the uh, local titanium frame builder out there in Steamboat Springs, but lovely place. Yeah. Love yeah. And they hold there. a great, they hold a great gravel event there, like a non, a non race race, uh, an official race, uh, more, more a fun event. And, uh, that looks amazing. I'd love to get out there one day. Uh, I think that was just on this past weekend. So anyway, anyway, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, I mean, this week we've got a usual full episode. There's a, a bunch of new bikes to talk about. Uh, there's a few other components we'll get to towards the end. Uh, we've got a pick one. And uh, yeah, we've got a PSA as well. So I think we might jump in. But, yeah, buckle uh, up, everyone. Yeah, but before we do that, uh, I guess for anyone listening, uh, we want to hear from you about how we can do podcasts better. So at the moment, we're conducting our first listener survey for everyone who listens to this podcast and any other Escape Collective podcast. We want to know what you like about this show, what you think needs improvement, and what other podcasts you'd like to hear from Escape Collective. Your input helps shape the direction of this podcast itself as well as others we create in the future. So all the information is kept private and is used for the sole purpose of making us better. Head over to escapecollective.com forward slash survey to leave your feedback that will help us improve. So yeah, please do. Uh, And uh, yeah, be nice, be mean, doesn't matter. It's all uh, constructive. So thank you. I've gotten some pretty good feedback recently, Dave, so far. Oh, really? Granted, there are people I know who probably wouldn't tell me if it was bad, but they thought, they thought we were right. doing a pretty good job. Oh, that's nice. I only get it's negative a- feedback. So. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, one of us is doing a better job than the other. Oh, we'll see. Uh, There's a new episode right now. Time to show us what you got. Oh, thank you, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump into some of uh, the bigger news from this week. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start at the biggest. Uh, well... Dare I say, okay, maybe this is a bit biased because I've got it here for test, but for me, it's one of the more exciting bike launches that I've seen. And it's exciting because it's uh, basically like just rewound the clock of tech and has gone way back to basics. Uh, the new Specialized Crux DSW. So uh, it's the, yeah, Specialized brought back an aluminum, aluminum Crux. Uh, Brad, have you seen this thing? Yeah, I, I couldn't help but to notice it in my Instagram feed. Uh, every single account seemed to be posting something about <laughs> Specialized uh, has about a this bike. Even that. Howard Grotz, yeah. who I don't know if you know who that is, uh, yeah, an, af- sure. an athlete extraordinaire across many disciplines. Even he was posting about it. So you know, if it's in his feed, he's a bit mm. of a iconically cur- um, kind of curmudgeonly Instagram user. So when I see it on Howard's feed, I know it's really. It's really pervading my uh, my feet. So yeah, very exciting bike. I've been a big fan. So okay, where do we begin here? Uh, cool, cool bike. I think it's, I'd like to start by saying that. Mm. I don't think it's the coolest DSW um, series, shall we say, frame that has come along yeah. ever. De- Delusio it, Smart World is what yes. DSW stands for. Yeah, and yes. uh, yeah. So I'll let you explain that. But well. Yeah, so you probably remember the first Allay and then the Allay Sprint, uh, both in the DSW moniker, um, which featured, I guess, most notably like a forged um, a forged head tube. So with kind of like a bit of a protruding kind of stub of what would become a top tube and a down tube, which allowed like some overlap of the down tube and the forged element that is the front end of the bike. Um, to have a larger overlap and more weld contact, which um, essentially made the bike stiffer and more durable uh, without, Mm -hmm. I mean, not at a great weight penalty. In fact, it was probably weight savings in there. I don't remember what the numbers uh, and the claims were, but um, so it was, it was a head tube and um, and a, like a bottom bracket element that was sort of the same thing that had like the seat tube and the chain stays and the down tube sort of, molded where there was like an overlapping sleeve almost like an old lugged uh frame would do but obviously out of aluminum and um, huge diameters and large contact surfaces so the bikes were you know notoriously crit bikes and affordable so you could afford to crash them which is great and this i think true and great also for gravel use where the bikes are often strapped with bags or treated in ways that aren't um delicate and so uh so, you know, yeah, like you said, it's a it's a a big I would say probably the biggest bike drop of the last couple of weeks at least. And um yeah. I think it's Which gonna be interesting to say because it it is in theory it's a more entry level bike from Specialized, and yeah, it's got a bunch of geeks quite excited about it. So Yeah, and, and I mean we were kind of discussing this in a previous episode about how I think there is maybe a 
undercurrent of interest in simpler bikes than what mm-hmm. are commonly the highest end offerings these days. Um, yeah. I, I know as a mechanic, it can be tedious. I know owning the bikes uh, for those who aren't mechanics can be even more tedious. And I've had some good examples and some of those popped to mind when you asked about my interesting week of bikes in my work stand, um, which maybe we'll talk about. Uh, but so, you know, I think there's a little bit of a incoming backlash or sort of like a kind of regression in a way, at least among. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think yeah. bikes are crazy expensive these days, um, justifiably in some ways, but with, if you accept the premise, which I don't necessarily, I think some of the technical features and advancements in bikes are not necessarily necessary, I would say. Or adva- uh, or advantageous. Like yeah, they're, they're not yeah. really bringing uh, a, a user advantage. They're just not kind of there for the sake of being there. And yes. if you're being very skeptical, they're there because it's a selling feature. But right. long something, two something years down the path, it used to be. yeah, two years down the path, you're like, this selling feature is garbage. So... I mean, Having worked in a bike shop for a while and you being someone who's been around the the block a time or two, Dave, imagine, I mean, even now, if I see somebody coming with a first gen SRAM Red E-Tap bike, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh God, here we go. You know, any parts, it's like, eh. yeah, yeah. And now, and now that it's like pervading. I mean, industry, if it works, it works well, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah nothing wrong <laughs> yeah. with it, but if you need anything for it, yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that was only like five or what six years ago or something like that seven years maybe by now um yeah I don't know. eight i got out of time flies geez it's mm. 2024 anyway it was not that long ago but so let's yeah. say you know now everybody's got all these bikes and they're already kind of like a generation old for, for the first generation of access given that we have new stram red and new transmission stuff already and uh you know imagine walking into a bike with a uh, bike shop with this stuff in like 25 years like yeah, I got for sure. Guys walk in with twenty five year old bikes now. And I'm like, awesome! I love these bikes in the mid nineties. They're so easy to tune up, and they just yeah. respond to everything perfectly, and they still work, and they're super durable, and they're made to last. And I don't really see like too many bike parts, at least not common bike parts, that uh, I would describe that way right now. No, this frame, no, there is a lot of redundancy. Frame, to bring it full circle, uh, yeah, is a step back towards that direction. No internal headset routing. Simple yep. as far as internal routing goes through the down tube, nothing fancy. I would assume I haven't seen one in person, but um, my hunch is that it's pretty straightforward. Bike an, to English, live with. an English shredded bottom English bracket. English shredded bottom bracket. A 27.2 well, millimeter round seat post, I mean, an external clamp, regular through I mean, axles. Specialized didn't reinvent uh, another seat post wedge. I can't believe it, but um, yeah. no, thank God it's, it's all uh, common kind of normal stuff that yeah. i think is going to be a pretty popular bike i would expect for sure so yeah so i mean basically they've specialized i think it was 2019 was the last time we saw an aluminium uh crux which the crux being sort of like they're more performance race oriented initially it was a cycle cross race bike these days it's more of a gravel race bike which can dabble in cycle cross even though you, i'd argue the geometry is not as ideally suited as it once was to that discipline. Uh, and yeah, uh, in in the years since, they've only had carbon fiber versions and it's kind of been like the off-road going version of an Athos in terms of its simple design and like almost round tubes, which are really focused on weight. Uh, and yeah, this is this aluminum version is basically like a replica, but in in alloy. Uh, it's It looks a whole lot like the carbon version. All the features are the same. All the geometry is the same. Uh, the only notable difference other than it being alloy and therefore heavier is uh is that it's also moved to a universal derailleur hanger dropout so i mean that's in a sense it's newer than the the current carbon version but but yeah otherwise it's if you've seen the carbon version you've probably in a in in a way already seen the alloy version uh and yeah specialized make some big claims uh you know they they tend to whenever they release a new bike claim that it's the best at something uh this one is the lightest gravel aluminium frame ever is what they're claiming uh which i mean i can't really think of a production gravel aluminium frame that's lighter this one's sub 1400 grams which is pretty light for uh, such a frame and then they've combined that with the same fork off like the s works crux which is you know so it's it's not a this isn't uh, a budget alloy bike we should probably say i mean talking like uh 
was it, it was three thousand US dollars for? Uh, I think twenty six hundred US. Oh yeah, maybe. maybe yeah, you're right. Yeah, yep. something like yep. something like that. Anyway, no, yeah, that's exactly there. not it. cheap. Yeah, not exactly twenty six level numbers. Yeah, yeah. So twenty six hundred um, for a, a complete bike, seventeen hundred for a frame set, uh, and yeah, there's only the one complete bike at the moment, and that comes with a Apex one by twelve Explore mechanical drivetrain. Uh, so yeah, and that's the bike I've got in for test. Well, we got off by me sort of saying I wasn't as excited about it as I wanted to be. But yeah. I want to circle back about why that is. Uh, okay, it, please do. So after having described DSW concepts uh, just a moment ago, I will say this one yeah. is lacking lacking the concepts that I just described. In fact, well, at least the head, yeah. the head to um, yeah. there's configuration. Only, it's only there's around only the one BB. element. Yeah. yeah, like the bottom bracket, uh, which probably is the mo- more important of the two elements um, in terms of the structural nature of um, what it adds to the frame and the, you know, its ability to sort of align, as it were, the uh, the you know with the crank and, and BB area with what hopefully is in alignment with the uh, the rear end of the bike. But um, that whole structure allows that uh, to be, I, I would say, more successful than let's say some older alloy frames. Cannondale comes to mind where you would have some occasionally very misaligned um, BB thirty bottom mm. bracket shells and. Uh, that's another conversation that we could really get into uh, <laughs> uh, down a hole on, but um, but yeah. so uh, it so this new Crux uh, DSW frame has the kind of forged element only at the down tube uh, bottom bracket kind of chain state interface area C tube all that area uh, does not have the head tube that was so um, you know it was kind of what what got the ball rolling with this whole DSW sure. concept in the first place. So that, I kind of missed that. That head tube, yeah, I mean, that that head tube you described, that DSW head tube is present on the current LA Sprint as well, uh, which came out a few years ago. And I reviewed that bike and it was very polarizing. A lot of people thought that head tube with the welds kind of midway through the tube were pretty ugly. Uh, and, you know, for me, I thought it was like, I mean, it wasn't pretty, but I was, I kind of appreciated it for the design difference that it offered. Uh, you know, it was like, same. Yeah. It doesn't yeah I, I felt exactly like the same. Every other frame out there. Um, yeah. But yeah, this one does keep things simpler. It does just have like, you know, a, a, a typical sort of uh, mitered tube to, a, you know, more regular head tube. But then that down tube is one piece all the way through to the bottom bracket junction. And then they weld the chain stays and seat tube onto that. Uh, and then within that sort of like molded, bottom bracket junction sits uh, a bottom bracket shell that they've actually then welded in place within that so it's kind of like a shell within a shell uh and yeah i think it's an interesting design uh i mean certainly that they're, they're trying to do it to save weight and to optimize stiffness uh with a, you know with reduced weight but uh yeah I, I think time will tell whether the design they've done collects dirt or anything like that because it's quite a an open open shelf right. It's yeah, always fun exactly. to discover what collects and how and where inside these frames with when you uh, yeah when you yeah. get to dig through them yeah yeah but yeah I guess uh, I guess the main takeaway of this bike is that uh, when yeah I mean people like us get so excited for a bike that basically removes all the features then I think it's a a pretty good sign that maybe the bike industry as a whole needs to look at what features are actually adding value to the consumer and what are just purely sales features that might not actually be in the best interest of the customer. And I think while Specialized is charging a premium for what is effectively quite a basic bike, uh, I think they do deserve kudos for actually understanding that people want simplicity. Uh, And they're one of the few brands, which is crazy to think, but they're one of the few brands that's actually offering a simple choice for people that want it. I agree. I um I think it's going to be a hugely popular bike. We sell specialized at my shop and uh, I'm, uh, I, it's a kind of bread and butter bike for the type of bikes we sell a lot of in the, in the category. So um, I'm pretty excited about it for that, for that reason. And uh, yeah, I think, I think in general, the industry kind of forces some stuff on people who aren't really ready to have it, you know, and it makes owning and yeah. operating a bike. If you're like new to cycling, kind of overwhelming mm-hmm. actually. Um, yeah, that, that's the concern that I have with some of 
where we're going. And I think there's definitely room for it at the high end. And, the, you know, there's a certain tier of customer who wants to, it's like buying a certain car, you know, it's like, wow, this is great, except that, you know, I have to pay somebody a lot of money to keep it going. And if that's not something you're willing to do, and I think yeah. for a lot of folks in the middle of the market kind of price points, they're not really looking to spend a fortune and have their bikes constantly in the shop being worked on. Um, and unfortunately, I feel like the way bikes are going, both they're a little bit more complex. Working on them is difficult because of the routing of things. And um, it's just not really approachable to people who are new to it. And I feel like that's my yeah. number one concern. I feel like this bike um, might result a lot of that for people who, you know, for that, sure. very, that very c- customer who's maybe not willing to spend 12 or 15 grand on a, you know, high end super Gucci gravel bike, but just want something they can live with and ride daily and not, which is too much most about. of us, most of yeah. us, in, in, me. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I have yeah. that other bike too. And, uh, yeah, I much prefer living with a bike like this. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, speaking of other bikes, uh, let's let's move on. And uh, we've got uh, I've got three other new bikes on my list that have all come out within the last week or so. Uh, some look great. Others, oh, maybe not. Uh, Bianchi Arcadex. Uh, they this bike. Uh, it was only a few years ago on a previous podcast that uh, Kaylee and I and James uh, awarded this bike uh, the ugliest bike of the year. Uh, and said some mean things about it. It was pretty hideous. Uh, Bianchi have overhauled this bike now. So, uh, and it's no longer the ugliest bike on the market. Uh, I actually, I think it looks quite nice. Uh, they've basically moved it to be a more adventure focused, uh, bike, sort of like a, imagine like a Santa Cruz Stigmata or a Canyon Grizzle, that kind of bike. And yeah, meanwhile, they've got the, uh, Bianchi have the Impulso if you're into more the racy end of things. Uh, so yeah, it's room for 700 by 50 millimeter tires. There's actually a storage hatch in the down tube, which is right on trend. Uh, it's unfortunately still sticking with internal cables through the headset, but the rest of it looks pretty good. Uh, complete bikes with apex start from 3000 euro and, uh, yeah, it's a carbon frame. So it's a bit, a bit higher end than that, that, uh, crux we're just talking about, uh, other details, it's got a, a universal derailleur hanger and this is it's suspension corrected geometry as well. So you can put a like a you know, rock shocks or fox fork straight on the front of it. Brad, have you had a look at this thing? I did look at this thing. So I have a question for you first before we jump into oh, yeah. my thoughts. Uh, what is the, currently the, the ugliest bike in your opinion, if not this bike? It's the previous generation Arcadex. <laughs> But is it, but since it's no longer, do you have a second uh, second place that might have just taken over the crown, or you can think about that if you don't have it ready to go? I don't know. I feel like the the previous generation was so ugly that there probably is no second place. You just got to go yeah. to a third place. Yeah, but like I yeah, think yeah. it occupies its own. Yeah, no, I don't, I actually don't know. It just, just it just had lines. Like it just was quite swoopy, and it just had lines that didn't really mesh. It just didn't really flow as a bike. Uh, and it had like weird storage hatches that they couldn't really explain the the purpose of. I think it was either designed as a frame that could handle e-bike purposes, like dual purpose, both analog and e-bike, or they'd put hatches in there for like DI2 that never came. Uh, but at the time, it was just like, what is this thing? So, uh, but yeah, I mean, this this new one actually looks yeah, like it's a clean. good change. What's clean? Um, yeah. So I would say this is like my least favorite category of bike of all, probably. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Maybe not. Maybe like fat bikes are worse, but. Um, <laughs> like gravel but, in general or, or like adventure style gravel? Uh, adventure style bike packing, multi day, whatever. You yeah, know. sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. And yeah. so to it's be not exciting, my style of riding either. Yeah. To be exciting would require a lot it, i would not necessarily say this bike uh did that for me it seems a little bit like sure. it's borrowing a lot of existing ideas from it other is. bikes and maybe making a, a consolidating them into one bike or putting a little italian celeste paint uh, and flare on it to make <laughs> it slightly different but fundamentally the same um so that's kind of my opinion it's a, it's a good idea i'm not sure bianchi's my first choice when i'm thinking about buying a, a bike like this uh, anyway but um <clears throat> 
you know, it's it's nice. We're talking about Bianchi a lot more than I feel like I've ever talked about Bianchi yeah, these well, last two yeah, weeks. I mean, anyway, last week we doing? had the we had the their factory, which is yeah, the, like a eco friendly renovated factory, and yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, and then this week we've got uh, a new bike, and we've got yeah, they've, this they've bike. been keeping my inbox busy. Yeah, I bet. Well, so what I will say about this one and about the previous discussion of the crux um, and about a previous podcast as we forecast the future of gravel and all things, um, the UDH suddenly common on all new gravel bike frames. And I think that's uh, going to be something that every new bike is going to be coming equipped yep. with now that uh, we've For seen sure. the teasers from Unbound and the new Explorer group and the blah, yeah, blah, blah, SRAM, and the ability to tr- transmission uh, yep. mullets and this thing. So, it's cool to see everybody getting on board, and uh, I guess that sets the tone for what we're. Yeah. So my in for. my understanding is that in mountain bike world, uh, Shram brought out the UDH, being like, "This is the one universal derailleur hanger, and everyone should get on board with it because it, it's better for the customer." And I think a few brands were put into the loop, being like, "You should get on board with this because we're going to release a drivetrain that requires this interface." But some smaller brands were not given that information. And some were like smart enough to be like, oh, SRAM must be doing something in order to go to this effort. Some were smart enough to just be like, yeah, this is better for the customer. I don't I don't want to have my own derailleur hanger when every other brand is using a single derailleur hanger. And then some brands were like, mm, no, we like our derailleur hanger. Forget about it. And then <laughs> SRAM released the transmission. They're like, oh no, what have we yeah. done? We've just released a bike without a UDH. <laughs> uh, so I think that lesson had been learned in the mountain bike space. And now... In the drop bar world, no one is taking that chance. They're like, they don't want to basically miss out on like being able to spec new SRAM when it comes out. So it does seem like every everyone is kind of rushing to get a UDH compatible bike in the market. Uh, and then at the same time, it does seem like there's a big trend, especially that we saw in Unbound, of wider tires being used. Uh, so you know, this Bianchi being able to fit like 700 by 50 is is wider than i would have guessed from from the italian brand i mean they've historically been a bit more traditional in that sense uh so yeah i mean a 50 mil tire within a a road uh within a gravel with crank set is is quite competitive uh so yeah i think there's some nice things about this bike what stood out to me is that they actually are selling a bag package with <laughs> yeah. the bike yes. <laughs> um, yeah a four which piece is, set. is quite euro yeah yes. yeah uh so yeah you can buy a a package of four bags that are sized to the frame, which I think is kind of a neat idea. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, yeah definitely more a cyclo cyclo touring kind of uh, offering than than a, a true gravel offering in that sense. But um, I'm uh, I'm enjoying this bike, and I think it's a, a great improvement from what we what we previously saw with that name. So uh, let's move on to a, another bike. Uh, Ellsworth is back. So I, uh, I'm trying to think how many years ago it was now. I am going to say 14 years ago when it was, when I was last there, I used to work at the distributor for Ellsworth. So I know, I know the brand quite well and, and that's the truth. Uh, they've brought back the roots, which was originally a cyclocross bike. They've now brought it back as a gravel bike. Uh, I should also say Ellsworth as a bike brand is back as well with uh under the helm of uh the original owner tony ellsworth uh but yeah they've they've brought back a new gravel bike and uh it fits a maximum of a 700 by 40 millimeter tire brown brown they didn't get that memo yeah i mean it, it feels like this is this shift has happened quickly but it does feel like to release a bike with that level of you know with that amount of tire width it's it's basically telling the world that it's one, you're either missed the mark, or two, you're calling it a gravel bike when it's actually an all-road bike. Uh, yeah. And I'm gonna I, I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's the latter. Yeah, well, it is. It's inevitably the latter. I think uh, whether they wanted it to be or not, because of what limitations <laughs> it <laughs> inherently has. But um, you know, I like we kind of mentioned before too. I think the gravel uh, sector is on its way to kind of subdividing itself into many categories and this may fall into the just barely a gravel bike category by yeah you know, what's what the potential of a gravel bike seems to be these days um mm-hmm. so it's kind of like uh i mean i guess in a, 
the crux, uh, carbon one might yeah. have a little more tire clearance than that. But um, yeah, I, kinda, I mean, a crux fits a forty-seven. Yeah, so, I, but yeah. I like a racier style gravel bike that's like not for everyday riding. Or, or, well, for everyday riding, not for multi-day riding. Um, yeah. Where it's a little bit more of like a race oriented kind of performance oriented thing. That's just my style anyway. But uh, when it comes to how I like my personal bikes to be kind of purposeful and streamlined and not having a bunch yeah. of stuff attached to it. But um, so I, for me, you know, I always ran, I never ran wider than a 40. I had, a, I had an addict, uh, Scott addict mm-hmm. gravel bike um, until recently. And uh, I was running yeah, 40s Which is on a very that. racy it, gravel it, bike. It, yeah, yeah. Very racy, very lightweight. Um I wasn't going to take it on single track and like go bombing down some wild stuff. That's what I have a mountain bike for. So for <laughs> me, I kind of like that category of bike personally. Sure. I actually yeah. do. But I, I concede to you that they maybe could have at least made 45 or 47 like kind of possible because. Yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, this bike does look, yeah, it does look more on the road side of things as far as aesthetics go. It does. It's, you know, integrated cabling through the headset. It's, it's using, you know, um, uh, yeah integrated cockpit in that sense uh carbon fiber frame probably worth mentioning and it's yeah i it looks a little generic to me it looks a little bit catalog like in in its shaping it looks like something that like i've seen a dozen times already uh i don't know if if that's fair but yeah well how deep should we really get involved with what ellsworth used to be but for me, I agree with you, first of all, and we see other brands that are sort of like Ibis comes to mind, Kona's kind of come mm-hmm. to mind a little bit, these old kind of iconic brands from the 90s who I guess in every, in every one of those cases sold to some other holding company or whatever. And then in Not least, Ibis. Oh, you know, Ibis then, did, and then they're they, back. Yeah, sorry, and then, you're right. But the, and yeah. now they're all back. Yeah, yeah. Kona, sure. Kona bought themselves back. I see where you're going with this. Back, okay. But they bought yeah. themselves back, like, have nothing now really to do with their down. original stuff, you know? It's yeah. like, kind of looks like they went to the the Taipei show and, like, picked something out of a catalog they could put their name on and call it a carbon fiber mm-hmm. Ellsworth. You know uh, what I, mean? I, I will I defend know. Ibis in this case because I have one, but uh, okay. carry on. Sorry. That, that Mojo SL <laughs> yeah. from, like, 2000 and what was it, like, 10 or 11 or something? That was a pretty, yeah. ugly, a pretty ugly thing. Sorry. Yeah, uh, it didn't. I actually owned one, uh, and no I offense, was proud then. of it. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Please, offend away. Okay. Uh, I, I, I owned one, yeah. so I can talk trash. Okay. Uh, I owned one before they sponsored Brian Lopes, and when they uh. sponsored Brian Lopes, they quickly brought out a new linkage, which added a ton of stiffness to the rear end. Uh, it was a flexy, flexy bike before that. Uh, and it was a pretty flexy bike after that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and also I ended up selling it because the lack of ability to hold a water bottle just killed me inside. Um, so that's why I got rid of that bike. But uh, it was, it was, it, it spoke to my inner weight weenie of the time. Um, I, I should also say every single one of these brands too in their first version in the 90s was awesome. Like iconic, <laughs> like I would love any one of like their best sure. bikes from that period of time. They're all were so good, so cool. Yeah. Uh, so kind of, it's hard for me to get excited about them, even if they are good objectively. It's like eh, it's not quite the same for me. Yeah, pers- pers- yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it's it's nice to see Ellsworth back, but so far I haven't seen anything super compelling as to why why you would jump at one versus a lot of other options. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, if you're interested, Ellsworth Roots, you can check it out. Uh, complete bike start from $5,500 uh, US. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, they've also got, yeah, the, they do have the truth back in the range and they have the Rogue as well. And uh, who knows, maybe one day they'll have an epiphany. Uh, I couldn't help myself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> niche, niche joke. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm just trying to think of how to work in the few that I came up with, but I don't, I don't dare. I dare you to. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Uh, last one on the new bikes list is uh, Obed, O-B-E-D. Uh, they have the R-V-R. That's a lot of acronyms. Uh, and yeah, it's, you know, it's you know, Obed endurance. is not an acronym. Isn't it? It's just capital letters. Huh. I, I, okay. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. No, I think it's you're a, right. It's a place in Tennessee. It's a wilderness yes. area and river in Tennessee where light speed oh, okay. 
uh, used yeah. to be located. And if I'm not mistaken, there's some connection between no, light speed. There is. Uh, there and is this a connection. new Obed, not just that Lightspeed had a model called the Obed in ah. the late 90s, if I'm not mistaken. It was a mountain bike hardtail. There's, there's more than a connection, Brad. Uh, yeah. It's because Obed is owned by the American Bicycle Group, uh, who also own Lightspeed and Quintana Roo. Can't sneak anything past me, Dave. Nope. It's basically the same company. Uh, so Obed is kind of like they're more, I, I guess, all the bikes in the range from what I can tell are carbon fiber uh, and it, they're consumer direct as well. So it's a, a different business model. And yeah, I think this new RVR, it's an endurance road bike. It's got space for up to th- uh, 700 by 35 tires. It is UDH. So another one on the list there that 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 ticks that that new feature box. Uh, and yeah, I guess the reason why I wanted to chat about it is it just looks like it has a pretty uh, good geometry for, for the masses with uh, pretty generous stack heights, which uh, not enough bikes have. So uh, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing with this. Uh, but yeah, that, this one's really more for, for people in the USA because, because of the business model, because of the location of the brand. But uh, complete bikes start from uh, $3,100 for a 105 mechanical or $3,600 for 105 DO2 or SRAM Rival Explore Group. So, uh, but yeah, I, Brad, I don't know if you've ever been to Obed's website, but they kind of have this, this cool bike builder thing that lets you configure your bike. Have you, have you had to play with this? I have not yet played with building my future Obed. <laughs> you probably don't need to, given you work well, in a bike I'm an shop American. that doesn't, doesn't sell yeah, this. Yeah. But uh, True. Uh, I think, yeah, it's it's cool. Like they they obviously they're they're painting and assembling these bikes in the USA in house, and I think that affords them the ability. Uh, you know, they're not the only ones to do this. There are there are some other brands that um, Ari is the other one uh, that that does a similar thing. And I'm struggling to remember what they what their full name used to be. What was Ari called? Oh, Fazari. Fazari. And now remember? they're just Ari, aren't they? I yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah Ari. Yeah. Sorry, that was a okay. recent change, and it's already it's out like of my Kanye, mind. Like Kanye, you know, their their rebranding's clearly working because I've already for- I'd already forgotten the the previous name. Uh, yeah, so similar idea, but yeah, you, they're basically, uh, assembling the bikes on demand. So you can pick like the handlebar you want. You can choose your wheel set, which changes the price. You can choose your tires. You can choose your gearing. Uh, you can choose your, your, your color of paint. So you end up getting a, a bike that's pretty much yours. Uh, and it's, and it's well-priced as well. So I kind of like this if you, if you're in the, you know, if you really know what you want, you know, what sort of bike size you need. I, I quite like this as an option. Yeah, I wish that um, I wish that, that the ability to spec your bike a little more. Specialized kind of played with this as an option for like a year, and I don't think it uh, as a business model was to their satisfaction, and they stopped it. It's um, it's logistically a nightmare for a big yes, brand that's dealing yes, with bike shops. Yes, yeah, of course. Um, but it would be nice if it was less of one because. Uh, as an example, that came up today in the bike shop, a uh, customer is interested in a new tarmac, has an integrated handlebar stem front end, um, needs a different size than what comes stock on the size bike he would get. And we're trying to give him like a quote on what it was going to cost. I mean, it's like, you know, we're doing some hydraulic internally routed work, you know, brake bleeds and integrated routing to everything. And, you know, plus the cost of this the new handlebar itself. I mean, you're talking like 500 yeah. bucks probably for like, yeah, it's, or more. it's not Maybe, a custom shop can absorb. That's for no. sure. And, uh, and then you're stuck with the random <laughs> take off one piece handlebar. That's not for you. And so what do you, what do you do? So there's really no way for a customer to have any experience other than that from a lot of brands, yeah. um, yeah. who have gotten on the one piece, uh, you know, this is, kind of circling back to our crux conversation and uh, the revelation of a simple bike but um yeah to have that option is really cool so yeah whatever yeah, for sure. however you feel about this frame and uh or whatever else uh i'm excited that they give you that much room to tailor it to suit yep. your needs assuming you for know sure. what your needs are in the first place yeah yeah i mean i'm thinking like from my point of view like i if I were to buy like, yeah, I mean, let's use the tarmac as an example. So I've ridden that SL8 and uh, a 54 centimeter in that comes with a 42 with handlebar. And I think it came with a 172.5 millimeter crank. 
And if it were my own bike, I'd want a 40 mil, a uh, 40 centimeter handlebar with a 170 crank. And right away, you're looking at at least a thousand dollars more to make those two changes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if the brand just offers you the ability to, to say, no, I, I want these two things it, in theory, I mean, those parts are the same cost if they're installed at the factory at the same time. So, uh, you know, there's no additional cost to the brand and then you get your perfect bike at no additional cost. So, uh, I like this business model. I understand the logistics of why a brand like giant or specialize or Trek can't necessarily do this. I mean, they, they really are selling boxes in a sense, but it's, uh, uh, but yeah, it is, it is cool that, you know, I guess there's, there's a gap in the market for other brands to do this. Brad, do you have anything on your mind this week that you want to share? Yeah, well, uh, I do. I want to share about oh. so- something I thought would never happen in real life, but it did. And it both made me frustrated, but also very happy in retrospect because I get to think about it forever. And uh, it was a customer brought in a bike with uh, some shifting problems and dropped the chain off the smallest cog. This is a new Crux purchased from our store uh, not that long ago, like maybe last year, but about a year older, not, not quite, maybe even a year. And uh, so, you know, first I'm like, oh, you know, that's not good. wonder what it could be. Bike kind of gets over into my hands, and um, sure enough, they put on a new chain, a SRAM flat top, uh, as they're known to some chain um only to discover they put it on with the flat part on the bottom uh, uh, flat bottom yes the quick link has an arrow on it that tells you which way the chain should be going and it was pointing mm. in the other direction and as mm. obvious as i thought it would be to those you just have to look at it to determine which the top which is the top and which is the bottom i was mm-hmm. chagrined to discover that in fact it had been installed in such a way that uh it was not a flat top after all so um mm. that was one that flat, i feel like flat sram flat yeah, bottom chain it was a flat bottom make chain. the skipping go round it did it did and yeah. uh but it it made me think that maybe i should just at some point use this platform to remind people to especially given yeah. dave your your penchant for uh, the chain waxing uh it's very popular, and chains are I'm somewhat directional. Reformed. It got too popular for me. I know, me too. Yeah. I tell people there's a lot more they should be looking at on their bikes than that. But anyway, that's uh, a digression. The point is, when you are ch- waxing your chain, if you are waxing your chain, uh, be aware, too, that Shimano chains are directional as well uh, for just about all of them in the modern era for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, yeah, It's uh, indicated by engraving on one side that side faces you faces out from the bike as you look at it uh in the work stand so if you're going to pull your chain off to wax it and get that extra 0.001 watt uh be sure you put your chain back on the right direction or you might have squandered that fraction of a watt away right away um so yeah i I will correct you before before Ah. i get inundated with emails uh most people (laughs) Uh, the benefits of waxing are not necessarily all about the friction. It's oh, yeah. it's predominantly dur- durability when you do it yeah, right. But, uh, yeah, but we understand. Like, we know. Yeah. yeah. So I guess going back, like this is kind of, I guess this will double as our PSA for the week as well. But it's, uh, yeah, the the common, it's quite common for people to install the quick links backwards. And it's because the, most of them these days have a little arrow, like Shimano as well puts a little arrow on it. And it, it confuses people because that arrow is meant to pace, uh, face forward when the chain is in at, at the top span so the the arrow is pointing forward towards the forward of the bike when the chain is at the top but uh where the way the chain loops back around at the bottom that arrow would actually be pointing towards the back of the bike uh when you install it and then the it's bottom. just crazy so, going through that derailleur oh which way yeah, is it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, people do definitely get confused on this but uh, yeah if you're if you're installing the chain, you know, at the bottom of the bike, uh, you know, where the derail is floppy, uh, that arrow points towards the back. And then, yeah, as you bring the chain around, you'll see that the arrow suddenly magically points towards the f- front of the bike when the chain's at the top. And that is the correct way to install it. Yeah. Uh, the direction the chain goes when you pedal the bike, that's just is all, mm-hmm. all you need to know. Yeah. It's, and then, yeah, SRAM, yeah. flat top, flat top, at the top, flat. The top. 
the cloud. And if yeah. you had an old chain and you put a new chain on and it's doing something weird, just take a second look at it before you, you know, drag it into the yeah. bike shop and ask why. You know, just perhaps. That's the fault. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's the other very, very common mistake is missing the little tab through the derailleur. There's like oh, a God. little guiding tab. Yes. Uh, that's the other super common one where you sort of link from one pulley wheel to the next pulley wheel without actually routing the chain completely correctly. And then you're just sort of grinding the chain through the derailleur and it's like... Uh, support tab slash i don't know what would you call it, like anti anti drop tab it, it's like a chain bounce prevention tab to like help guide mm-hmm. the chain from one pulley to the next without bouncing causing it to bounce and flop off to this one side of the yeah. tooth and then derailing itself on the pulley essentially yeah yeah but is it really necessary i've always wondered that too because it does make everything a little bit trickier yeah yeah, well, I guess some people they ride their bikes enough with the chain installed wrongly that they wear it away, and then they <laughs> and then the and then the derailleur still works. So yeah. maybe it's not necessary. I uh, I don't want to name any names, but an athlete I used to work with uh, one time had spent like more than a week. It was between two races where we were home, more than a week riding with it like that. And then when I packed the bike back up to go on the next trip, it was like that. And mm. Never even mentioned that there seemed to be anything peculiar about it. Yeah, but, right. um, so then that raised a lot of other questions that I had about everything. But uh, anyway, yeah, um, right. you know, if you replace your own chain and sudden, suddenly something seems pretty unusual, just give it give it a second yeah. go. Yeah, that would be my first my first advice. But I would say there's more nuance to it than it seems like there should be or or yeah. used to be. And people might be thinking about how it used to be to put a new chain on your bike. But there's a little bit more to pay attention to especially the electronic drive trains and clutches and all this type of stuff you're kind of navigating on modern bikes it's a kind of there's a little more nuance to the yeah chain they're definitely these days. nuance and sensitivity to adjustment as well yeah like it doesn't take much to throw off shifting these days so uh yeah it, things have to be pretty precise these days and uh routing the chain backwards can can cause said issues and so, the reason for this, for the chain being directional in the first place, by the way, is to sort of interface with shift ramps on cassettes and shift ramps on chain ring uh, on the backside of your big ring to pick the chain up and stuff like that's why they're that's the premise of all of this. Just for those listening, um, is to clean up the shifting, make it crisper and perhaps quieter. Um, it's been going on since sort of uh, I would say probably seven or eight speed days. You really started from the, that era on to now. It's just more and more refinement in that department. Um, that has led us to now having chains that are not unidirectional like they used to be and kind of require some special paying attention to make sure that everything is accurate again because uh, even though it's a little thing, it uh, it does matter and does make a difference and you can actually notice it. So, For sure. Yeah. Be aware. All right. A good PSA, a good on your mind. Uh, Brad, uh, I want to do a, a pick one, which uh, may may be quick, it may not be, but uh, I want to do a pick one of Greece, uh, which is a you know, I mean, this is the Geek Warning podcast. I mean, people are like Greece, really? You want to talk about Greece? But uh, yeah, I mean, if you could only have one tube of Greece in your toolbox, uh, which one would you be picking? And and I will I will let you uh, uh get a little bit more nuanced than this and explain that you. You might want other things other than grease, but uh, but yeah, one grease. Say you're a home mechanic, you just want one grease to use across the bike bearings, installing press fits, installing threads, whatever it may be. What what's do you have a grease that you love? Motor X Bike Grease Two Thousand. Sometimes, oh my, that's I'm mine. pretty sure. Okay. I'm pretty sure it could also be the same exact grease as there a special grease. Shimano yep. branded, but yep. exactly I the same stuff. I have never style. seen anything that makes me think otherwise on that. No. So, and yeah. uh, if you have a Shimano derailleur and it hasn't been in my work stand before, uh, chances are there's a huge glob of it on either end of the spring inside your derailleur hmm. uh, for you know for a rainy day because they use a ton of it where the spring kind of loops around on the parallelogram of the rear derailleur. Rear derailleur and Interesting. You, have just an excessive amount. I used to harvest it and collect it on new derailers and just keep using it. I had this never-ending grease tub. It was a thing at my old bike shop. If Greg Thomas is listening, he's been mentioned before, he'll know what I'm talking about. I still have it. Years later, I collected so much. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a huh. passion. Uh, so, but to your point, uh, I don't have to choose just one. And um, 
in fact, I have about a dozen options on my workbench at any moment, but uh, that's a good grease for everything. It really truly is. Um, there are some greases that are thicker that are more for like wool, preventing incursion of water into things. There are some that's very, very thin it's for fast bearing uh, performance. Um, for bearing stuff, specifically ceramic speed, they're kind of uh, saying the quiet part out loud by offering all these lubrication and grease products. I think they're, that's, that's where a lot of the, the speed really comes from yeah. when you see, I mean, I, I've gotten a lot of attention for some yeah. of the bottom bracket tuning that I've done over the years where you have them spinning and spinning and spinning. Um, most of that is from seal drag or, or the, the absence of seal drag and uh, which you can achieve by using a razor blade that you're uh, on your own seals, if you wish, um, removing them all together. Mm-hmm. If you want to, um, certainly using lightweight greases or even sometimes oils. If you know, you, you know, if you're, if you're handy with your bike, you, you might only get one ride out of it, but it'll feel amazing. And, um, but you can kind of tune these, uh, like a standard BB, for example, with some little tricks like this, using some nice, uh, low friction, very low viscosity greases. Ceramic Speed makes one. They used to call them time trial grease. They may have rebranded it under a new name, but it's like a very yeah. They've it's like got, I think grease, it's now race maybe. day or something. Race day yeah. greases, yeah, yeah. Um, that's like a. It's almost like you put it on your fingertip and just your body temperature warms it to like an oil. It's like it almost breaks oh, wow. down like that. It's a thin. Um, that's a wonderful one. I used to use that on like suspension pivot bearings and everything because we were servicing them so often that you never had to worry about it. Like displacing um and the amount of time that would happen between service so um yeah i would use that everywhere that's a really good one for bearing specifically but yeah that motor x uh grease it's like a kind of lime green um clear grease that is prevalent on on all like a little a little sticky but it's good in the bearings for like long lasting stuff it it doesn't get squeegeed away on like bb spindles when you put it through your bottom bracket bearings as you install a crank spindle or whatever um, even at a seat post, you know, uh, yep. it's, uh, if you're not on carbon stuff, uh, it's, it's good there too. So, um, yep. I keep a, like a syringe of that and that's kind of like my go-to assembly yep. grease and like every, everything grease. And then for like special bikes Ditto. and projects, I use some different stuff that's, you know, maybe a little more yep. purposeful in its intent. Yeah. So that, that Motor X bike, what is it? Bike 2000? Bike they call Grease it? 2000. What a great name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, and yeah, Shimano Special Grease is, is basically the same thing from what we can tell. So, I mean, if you if you find Shimano Special Grease, it is it is a more expensive way of buying it. But, you know, Motorex isn't easy to find everywhere. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really good. And uh, I like it because it's... Yeah, I mean, the properties we spoke about, it's waterproof. It, and it's also sort of known to be non-reactive with anything on a bike. Like, you pretty much, like, never hear of horror stories related with using it and getting like seal swelling or anything like that uh and then it's also i've I've never known it to stain paint where there are some greases that have like red dyes in them or similar that that actually have been known to like seep out of headsets and leave like staining on paint or under clear coats so this stuff is really well proven at this point i mean it's been in the market for decades and it's uh yeah i mean the fact that it comes pre-installed inside like every shimano hub out there is probably mm-hmm. proof that it's every crank it's, spindle it's, has a yeah. huge glob of it in there on a holotech yeah. uh, type crank yeah it's uh mm-hmm. they, they don't they don't hold back either it's just like they just like here we go <laughs> yeah. it's good it yeah there's no yeah. shortage of it is there so, uh, yeah, if, you're, if so. you're crazy you can harvest it and keep your grease tub going for in, infinity yeah that's, that's yeah my, i feel like i feel thing. like uh I feel like Fox suspension had been watching Shimano all these years overdo it on the grease and be like, all right, hold, hold my, hold my grease tub. And then (laughs) just went at it for the air pistons. So, um, yeah. Uh, very good. All right. Uh, yeah. So I guess, yeah, if you can only have one grease, that's the one I still would recommend probably owning something like a blue Loctite for a lot of threads where you don't want things to vibrate loose. I'd still recommend owning an anti-seize. It doesn't need to be anything specific, but still recommend an anti-seize for like threads into dissimilar materials that you might ignore for a long time. So uh, there's a lot of those on a bicycle. Uh, and and then, yeah, carbon paste is also good to keep around if you're if you're a a home mechanic or or a pro then yeah carbon paste for like handlebars and and seat posts are pretty handy so uh and that 
that is probably, you know, will cover most bases. Uh, you probably also need like a, a thin grease for free hub bodies, but, or suspension, but, uh, but now we're getting into the weeds and I'm going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. We're not all doing that stuff at home, Dave. Not like you. Yeah. Well, you are, but yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, me and you, but sure. Okay. That's why, that's why Uh, we're shouldering the burden for all these folks here on this podcast. (laughs) Very good. Very good. All right. There's uh, two remaining news items. Uh, Another product that you might have had your hands on being working at a specialized dealer, Brad. Uh, Roval Rapid CLX 2 Team Wheels. These have just come out. There's only 1,500 pairs available. Brad, have you seen these? Do you know what's going on? Uh, I, I haven't actually had my hands on these yet, I have to okay. say. I've, uh, we haven't seen, not the not these special edition ones anyway. Um, I've always had good experience with the Roval Wheels for the most part. Uh, I think Roval has always struggled as a wheel brand to crack the not specialized side of the market. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, yeah. I always considered it tacky to see a bike that had uh, Roval wheel set that wasn't a specialized kind of, you know? Um, yeah. I hate to say it. They actually, when I was working at Specialized a few years back now, um, they there was like a, an effort, a marketing effort to uh, present Roval on other brands of bikes. So there was like a period of time in the headquarters there in Morgan Hill, California, where there was like a line of all these other bikes that weren't specialized, which was yeah. like so crazy to see in there. You know, it's yeah. like a hundred, like a hundred bikes of like S work, Starmac after S work, wow. Starmac. That's all you see. And then it's like randomly weird other bikes. Um, yeah. For, oh, and and other like, brand, other wheel brands associated with big brands have done that. Like Kadex yeah, made a big exactly. effort, like all the bikes on their website for a while weren't giant. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, Bontrager as well, I think has, has played at that as well in the past. So it's, it's not a unique issue to specialized, but it's, uh, a common, a common occurrence. And it's tough to, it's been tough to shake it. And, um, but I used to use their wheels all the time because we were, you know, Sponsored by Specialized, sponsored by Roval. We had all that stuff, and uh, it was all very good. Mm. Um, the weights of these is pretty compelling. It's not crazy, but it's not bad. Yeah, so these, I guess to, to tell to tell about it, the, so it's basically the repeat wheel is the aerodynamic wheel. like a, It's a front and rear specific rims, approximately in the 50, 50 millimeter front and uh, 60-ish millimeter rear. Uh, and yeah, sorry, I don't actually have those exact numbers. Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's 48 and 62, but I could be wrong. So please don't uh, demand a correct uh, corrections corner. Uh, but yeah, they they basically, uh, the team edition is, uh, it looks much like the existing repeat wheel, but they've got a new layup in the rim, which saves a bunch of grams. They've got a new hub, which ditches the, the aero profiling of the, the current hub, but uh, shaves weight, makes it silver. And yeah, the, the outcome is, is they've shaved off 130 grams off the regular uh, 1500 gram weight of, of the repeat wheels. Uh, and yeah, it's the new hubs, new rim. Uh, they've also updated the spoke to a DT Swiss Aerolite 2. So they're claiming there is a marginal aerodynamic benefit with these wheels. It's pretty small. It's basically the ra- you know within the rounding era of, of wind tunnels. Uh, the outcome is a US $3,800 wheel set. Uh, and as I said, yeah, limited to 1,500 pairs. Uh, that price does seem very high, and it is, but you do then get uh, a bunch of things. You get in the packaging, there's some pretty fancy packaging to celebrate that you've bought a limited edition set of wheels. Uh, you get things like a set of tires, you get a Dyna plug, you get wheel bags, you get spare bearings, you get spokes. I think there's some bottles in there. So, I mean, yeah, you recoup some of the costs through uh, such set accessories. But, uh, uh, yeah. But a spoke's I mean, like I, a I, dollar. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, get, so. you, get, you get an extra free hub body you won't use because you only yeah. need the one, you know, you get yeah, the, for the, your the other free hub body. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's no way around it. This is an expensive version of a current wheel set, but yeah, they have saved weight. And for me, I think the thing that stands out is that when I reviewed the new SRAM Red Axis, uh, and it's got quite a lot more silver in it than previous generations, I said that this would bring, this would be the kind of the catalyst to a lot of brands bringing silver back once again. Uh, and these hubs in these Rovar wheels are silver. 
seemingly to match. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye out for an increasing number of silver parts. Uh, last on the list, uh, there's a recall. And Kuat, am I saying that right, Brad? How would you say it? I would say ku- Kuat. Kuat. I don't know if I'd say Q, but, you know. Kuat. That's just Kuat. what I would say. <laughs> okay. The Kuat. rack brand uh, yes. in nice the US. Yeah. Uh, bike racks, they have a recall that impacts approximately 86,000 racks. Uh, so That's yeah, got to be all of them. <laughs> this is a lot. So yeah, I it's, mean, it's, it's, it's racks sold between October 2020 through to June 2024. Uh, it's the, the Transfer V2 1 bike, the Transfer V2 2 bike, and the Transfer V2 three bike uh so yeah anything with the batch id from uh 2045 through to 2414 so just check your id and if you've got a rack that that is impacted by it um contact the company they will send you a free replacement pivot pedal assembly uh because yeah apparently the that pivot assembly was allowing some racks to drop down and grind away that's uh, that's, that's like the la- the only thing a rack is supposed to not do, basically. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. well. I mean, I've I've had bikes fall off of not this brand of bike rack, but I've had bikes fall off of other racks, and it's it's never a good feeling. And uh, yeah, no matter you know, even if you do overlay said video with uh, songs from Tony Hawk PlayStation game, it's still not <laughs> quite the same. Uh, so it's, it's better though. It makes it better, but still, it's quite. It is a horrible feeling to look back and not see the bike that you've been panically looking at for three hours yeah. of the drive. So, so uh, well, good on you, Kuat. Good, good luck with that. Eighty-six thousand. Yeah. That's a bunch. It's a lot of racks. Yeah, I mean, it shows that they've been quite successful though to date. Like that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's. A yeah, we sell rack. them. They're very popular. Yeah. We sell them at our shop. We actually had a customer who bought one this week and who brought it back as some element of it that was like related. I'm wondering if it is this issue. Uh, yeah. It didn't fall off their car, but they were just installing it. And like uh, there was a assembly that sort of broke and kind of felt it didn't like kind of fell out of the, of the hitch part of the rack. I wasn't involved in this. I was sort of like watching it from across the room and listening, but um, yeah. now it makes me wonder if it was related to this at all. Cause I, I just heard about this uh, mm. recall like yesterday. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, this recall this is, weekend, is so. impacting racks that are being sold currently in market yeah. so i'd assume if I'm you're buying check. a rack today then a shop would have updated it already but uh but yeah definitely check your batch id and and get onto that so uh yeah i mean that's that's this episode but i guess uh, i'm just gonna give a little plug for what i'm doing tomorrow i'm jumping on a plane and heading off to melbourne for the handmade bicycle show australia which is now called spoken uh and that's running this weekend in melbourne uh, out of Seaworks in Williamstown. So yeah, if you're if you're in Melbourne, you're listening to this, come on by. It's it's my favorite show to cover. Uh, it's yeah, it's a a hand built, handmade, custom bike show that um, has some of the most lovely bikes in the world, and they're really nicely displayed in a a nice open glass theater kind of room. And uh, I like it. Come chat with the builders, and uh, I owe you a high five if you see me. So. We have we are lucky in the United States to have a similar show. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the most interesting uh, solutions to problems you may not have really thought about are For sure. present on these bikes. Really, some amazing stuff. So, if you ever have a chance, if you're close to a handmade show, whether you're in North America, and go to the North American Handmade Bicycle Show down there in Melbourne. Let's go check out yep. Spoken. 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 Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the one you're mentioning, Brad, is uh, now made. Is the big oh, one God. in the US. Okay, uh, that's great. And uh, there's actually a made Australia happening again in Melbourne in two weeks' time. So there's there's competing there's competing handmade shows in Melbourne. Uh, and yeah, my goal is to head to them both. Uh, but yeah, I think the main thing, the main takeaway with these shows, and and certainly. Keep an eye on escapecollective.com for my coverage. I'll, I'll be doing full full galleries from the show. But uh, the main takeaway is that, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these custom builders are, are building things for customers who can't necessarily find exactly what they want in the market. And it often is a result of maybe the customer or the builder sort of seeing trends and, and reacting to trends before other bigger brands have. So you sort of 
you know, uh, historically we've seen, you know, out of this Australian show, for example, we, we saw the first uh, 3D titanium printed lugged bike through Bastion. Uh, we've seen uh, Prova do some pretty wild things as far as like polishing titanium underneath paint, but also like, uh, yeah, again, integrating 3D titanium printing in ways of like fitting a 50 mil gravel tire within a gravel bike before anyone else did. Uh, last year, we saw drop bar bikes with UDH derailleur hangers before any major brand had done it. So yeah, keep an eye on these galleries because they, they often uh, offer some insights into what uh, big brands are about to copy. So yeah, I think that's uh, for that reason alone, it's worth looking at. And then other reason to look at it is just some of these bikes are absolutely gorgeous. So uh, yeah, if you like bikes, you'll probably like this coverage and the show yeah have fun down there dude that sounds like a good time thank you thank you very much all right brad i think that's uh that wraps up this week uh yeah just uh, our usual shout out for our members thank you for any member of escape collective thank you for subscribing and for supporting what we do and allowing this podcast and everything else we do at escape collective to exist uh and if you're not a member then please consider joining uh your support does help this podcast to exist it helps our other podcasts to exist it helps us create the content that we want to create and that we think needs to be created so yeah head to escapecollective.com forward slash member and join all right that's this episode brad it was great to see you great to hang out always a pleasure dave until next week see you later i'll see you soon